Hinduism Concepts and Theories, welcome back to week 9, 9, 10, 11 and finally learnings and conclusions. Congratulations, you are in the home stretch and the last few weeks are arguably some of the most enjoyable, interesting concepts that I am going to be able to speak to you about. Today for lecture 20, I am also very pleased that I have been able to find time for Dr. Harmony Saganporia, Associate Professor at MICA Ahmedabad, to be able to come here and speak to you about her work. So today's hour is going to be a guest lecture by Dr. Saganporia, who as I mentioned teaches at MICA Ahmedabad. Her areas of work are culture and communication, she has a PhD in social history and her thesis was on the language and parole of feminist reformist discourse around the women's question. So when I say feminist, it's in quotes, it's about ways in which feminist work deals with the women's question and reform movements around it in late 19th century Western India. Some of these aspects have already been introduced to you in Dr. Karunakaran's lecture in relation to post-independence India. But today's lecture, given that our week concerns film, theatre and advertising, will span these concerns very specifically to do with Dr. Siganporia's work on female impersonators in Parsi theatre in pre-independence, post-independence India. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Siganporia, who is the author of the wonderful book, I Am the Widow, an intellectual biography of Behramji Malabari, which was recently awarded the Professor Sneh Marjan Award at the 80th session of the Indian History Congress. Without further ado, Dr. Harmony Siganporia. Today we are going to be talking about uh, a period in towards the end of the late 19th century and the beginning of the 20th when within a certain codified space known as Parsi theatre uh, there is a liminal moment where female impersonators and women are vying for the same roles and competing for what it would mean to occupy this space as performers. Um, I'm going to start by reading to you a, a, a very tiny extract from a scholar called Catherine Hansen, who is a theatre historian and has worked on this space significantly. Parsi theatre is immensely under-researched, which is why it is both exciting as well as a bit of a challenge to work on a space without an archive. The archive that we do have for Parsi theatre is in fragments and exists across primarily Gujarati and some, some texts come to us in Hindustani as well, which is why the work of scholars like Somnath Gupt, who Catherine Hansen translates into English, and Mrinal Pandey become very valuable to any scholar from the present attempting to reconstruct a period that we otherwise have very little access to. So Catherine Hansen says that contrary to the argument that performing women were unavailable, records show that the Parsi theatre employed both female impersonators and actresses for a considerable duration. In a sense, they competed against each other and companies and publics made choices about whom they wished to represent women on stage, men or women. Now this is a really telling extract, it's an extremely uh, succinct, if you will, uh, summation of precisely what we're going to spend the rest of this lecture unpacking, which is this notion that if gender is performed, then who would we have preferred to see perform femininity, I'm sorry, femininity <laughs> on stage uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. For a moment, I'm going to have to dial back and explain what I talk about when I talk about Parsi theatre. In some senses, uh, the term Parsi theatre is somewhat misleading. It only came to be because the earliest theatre houses as well as theatre companies were funded and owned by the tiny Parsi community, initially in and out of Bombay, but quite soon spreading across the rest of India. The primary languages, as I mentioned earlier, of Parsi theatre were Gujarati, Hindustani and Urdu. Uh, 
the first play that uh, the first Urdu play that we're familiar with within this space is something called Sone Ke Mool Ki Khurshid and uh, it was written by a Parsi playwright who went by the pen name Aram. Uh, it was despite the name as I said earlier a very in the Indian sense of the word secular site in that Parsi theatre saw representation from people of myriad faiths and all kinds of persuasions. Uh, it was considered to be a more rational form of entertainment than all the folk traditions which preceded it for a number of reasons, some of which are as follows. Parsi theatre uses what is known as the proscenium, the notion of the stage and a separation between the performer and their audience. This is a convention that it takes from well, all kinds of modern theatrical practice and that was part of why it was considered to be a more, as I mentioned earlier, rational form of entertainment than the folk media that come before it. There would be elaborate stage sets and costumes and of course something that we recognize even in present times, much song and dance. These are conventions that film actually acquires from Parsi theatre which is the first in some senses form of modern Indian theatre practice. The period that we're looking at, uh, since I started by saying we were looking at the late 19th century oozing into the 20th century, to put some kind of uh, a fixed boundary around it, what we're looking at is roughly the period between 1853, when you see the first of these, the first of these performances come to be in Bombay, and we can take 1931 as a rough cutoff date, which is primarily because it corresponds with the arrival of Alam Ara, which is the first Indian talkie. The end of silent cinema and the birth of the talkie is an effective hard stop in some senses to certain forms of Parsi theatre. I will speak more about this later in the lecture, but this is roughly the time period in question, 1853 to 1931. And as we move on, I will also elaborate on how this period itself is one that is extremely contested for several other reasons, because it also marks the beginnings of several social reform movements, the culmination of others, and the beginning of what in India came to be called the women's question all of which are ideas that we will unpack as we go. The earliest pieces that were performed for Parsi theatre came from Shakespeare, came from people like William Sheridan and other writers of the comedy of manners, but they quickly transitioned into um, tales that would be adapted from Persian epics like the Shahnameh, for example. And soon after that, the stories that we share in common, the Indian epics, the, the pan-Indian epics in some senses, uh, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Um, stories from these, but very particular stories from these. And if we had access to more scripts, we would have been able to ascertain how closely, uh, or perhaps not, they followed the more hegemonic tellings of a, a tale as contested and plural as the Ramayana. Uh, but since we don't have those scripts, it's impossible for us to, uh, to be certain whether they maintained fidelity to the canonical tellings of these epics or took certain liberties with them. What we do know is that after a period where these were the dominant stories that one came across on the Parsi stage, we soon transition into something known as the romantic social drama, which contains elements uh, recognizable to us to date in the form of the domesticity that is at the heart of some of the tellings that one still witnesses in telenovelas or soap operas for, for example. But domesticity and negotiating it is largely what we're talking about when we speak about the romantic social drama, which comes to be the dominant form uh, of Parsi theatre.
The particular aspects of Parsi theatre that I'm going to be speaking to you about today um, are about this time period that we have etched between 1853 and 1931. In specific terms, we're going to be looking at the overlap between the availability of female performers and female impersonators, which was the norm before female performers became available for this stage. And as we started by saying, what it meant for publics, theatre going uh, audiences obviously, theatre troops and performers themselves, what these choices might tell us about an incipient form of Indian modernity slowly coming to be crafted in this period. What did it mean when publics were much more willing to encounter the body of a female impersonator on stage rather than the body of a woman playing a woman. These are choices that tell us something about the period, they tell us something about a society in flux and the kinds of negotiations that we're constantly engaging in in the performativity of gender roles. In this case rather literally because it is specifically gender that is being performed on stage. Um, the period in question uh, it ought to be clear to us by now, but I'm going to tell you more about uh, a woman called Mary Fenton in a moment, but Mary Fenton is one of the first female stars of the Parsi stage and she becomes available to perform in Parsi theatre as early as the 1870s. Now despite the presence of not just Mary but a whole bunch of other female actors like her. Uh, it is still female impersonators like Master Champalal and later the, the stars of the scene Jai Shankar Sundari and Bal Gandharva who will have precedence over these female performers for a, f a couple of decades into the 20th century and it's interesting for us to wonder why or how that may have come to be. Now the reason that I focus on this is a, this is in a bid to try and decipher the grafting on the body of the female impersonator what it is that we speak about when we speak about the modern Indian woman of the nationalist imagination. Uh, the body becomes the site where some of these signifiers come to be stabilized even as others come to be attendant upon this body, they're grafted onto it. and. Some are obviously um, dropped in the process and it becomes interesting to see which markers become more dominant uh, in different periods that we look at even within this space. We also engage in the words of theatre historian Mrinal Pandey with the kind of continuities that we see between the performance of gender in a site like Parsi theatre and what remains to us in, in the world we live in today in the form of the spaces that are available for women and, and female performers in a medium like film. As Mrinal Pandey puts it, there is a direct connection between the young and baby faced Parsi theatre players of female roles and the present day portrayal of women in Hindi films because while the femininity on display may well be different in scope and degree, it is not different in kind. I told you a moment ago that I would tell you more about Mary Fenton, the first female performer who was a huge celebrity uh, within the Parsi theatre space. Now Mary Fenton is the daughter of uh, someone who used to be a soldier in the British Indian Army and once he retired he continued to live in India travelling from place to place with magic lantern shows. Uh, Mary Fenton, his daughter would be on the road with him. At some point she meets a young Parsi uh, theatre actor, director, writer called Kavas Khatau. They fall in love, they marry and she takes on the Parsi stage name Meherbai. Now it is held that uh, Meherbai or Mary Fenton if you prefer uh, had impeccable diction and could deliver excellently in Gujarati, Urdu and Hindustani. This made her a, a very coveted figure uh, within the Parsi theatre space. Uh, she and Kavas Khatau separated 
uh, in, in later times, but Meher Bai continued to perform uh, for a, a long, long time. Now, why did female impersonators enjoy the kind of currency that they did in the first modern form of Indian theatre that became available to us? It is because there are several folk traditions of long standing which have deployed female impersonators before we arrive at this juncture and Parsi theatre. Um, regardless of whether you're talking about Jatra as a tradition, Yakshagana, Bhavai from Gujarat, these are obviously folk traditions that come from different regions and parts of what we now call the nation state of India. Uh, female impersonation was the norm. Uh, female performers were not then and, and to date they don't remain a major part of each of these imaginations, of each of these, uh, of each of these performance traditions. For that reason, uh, Parsi theatre had an abundance of choices uh, when it came to recruiting the finest female impersonators for the stage. Because this was a tradition of long standing, it made a ready sense both for the theatre troops as well as audiences to, to continue or to perpetuate what was already the established norm when it came to uh, the performative body. There is no challenge being mounted to it in the early years because it is easiest. Now each company of course had to vie for the prettiest young boys with the most beautiful voices and they knew that it would bear very rich dividends. Now what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that audience response or reaction to some of these young performers was, um, was somewhat extreme. Uh, this is Mrinal Pandey again who tells us about records that, that, that she has come across about fan followings in Bombay which were enormous. Each master, uh, well each female impersonator, each master female impersonator would acquire large fan followings and they weren't past falling into a little bit of a swoon when they saw their chosen master female impersonator perform on stage. So we have uh, accounts of people literally falling in the aisles when they encountered say a Bal Gandharva playing Shakuntala on stage or perhaps uh, a Jai Shankar Sundari playing Sita. Um, as, as he did. So there's, um, there's a huge and, and, and rich kind of mythos around the kind of, of, the kind of effect that these master female impersonators had upon theatre going publics, uh, which were obviously comprising men, but as we draw into the early years of the 20th century, included also spaces for women. So these audiences are also mixed and we're going to spend some time thinking about the composition of this audience as we go, but I think it's important to bear in mind that it isn't exclusively men that these plays are being performed to. You have an increasing number of women also being part of theatre going publics, perha perhaps for the, for the first time. There are instances, and again this is Mrinal Pandey, there are instances of certain rather well-known uh, master female impersonators like a master Vasi from Lahore or a master Nisar whose voice was in her words a golden soprano it is said that could rise above the scales available on the keys of the harmonium. He died young and, and of very tragic circumstances and this also forces us to reckon with something that perhaps isn't immediately uh, the first thing that we arrive at which is the, the boundaries that circumscribed obviously the lives of these female impersonators because there were a stringent set of rules about what it meant to continue to stay in character even when you weren't performing and the kinds of boundaries that that would place around the mobility uh, in literal as well as, as well as metaphorical terms for these female impersonators was immense and it took something of a one could argue psychic toll on these uh, young 
child actors, for they were very young when they would have started working in the Parsi theatre space, because you're talking about young boys who are rosy-cheeked and have beautiful golden soprano-like voices. These are children, and sometimes we lose sight of that fact. That's, that's definitely something worth uh, bearing in mind. Now, all of this was modified, or, or, or I, I hesitate to say it changed overnight because it didn't. It changed eventually, and we will get into the reasons for it. But the beginnings of this change start with figures like Mary Fenton and later several other women who were in the first instance either British, Anglo Indian, or Jewish actresses who started to make themselves available to these troops. And these were traveling troops. Like I said, some of the earliest theaters that we're familiar with were constructed in Bombay. But quite soon, you had a spate of theaters around colonial cities, metropolises. So these troops traveled a fair bit. Calcutta had a series of playhouses, for instance, and there is a tiny repository uh, of a very fragmented archive, as we've, uh, as we've spoken about, still available in Calcutta because it had something of a tradition of troops, Parsi theatre troops coming through uh, this colonial city. The transition, even when it happened, was never going to be an easy one. Given the popularity as well as the rootedness of the ethos that surrounded the figure of the female impersonator, both audiences, theatre troops, as well as the performers themselves were extremely averse to taking on women players into their midst. Um, there are a series of reasons why, but I would urge you before you continue with the lecture to, to think about what those reasons may have been. Some of those reasons were obviously of a rather practical nature. If you had women traveling with you, you had to make se separate accommodation uh, arrangements. You had to arrange for them to travel in separate compartments from the rest of the troop because it stood to reason that for moral reasons, uh, there had to be a separation of the women from everybody else who was a part of these outfits. And there were a lot of people who had to work on each production. Because remember, we started by saying that the Parsi theater had elaborate stage sets and costumes, for example, which would, which would lead us to imagine that each theater troupe must have been of a rather significant size. Uh, apart from those separate practical concerns, there was also, as, as we're suggesting, the question of whether it was right for a woman to be traveling at all, whether it was correct for a woman to be seen in as public a sphere as a stage where her body was up for consumption by a theater going public. Uh, what did it mean for a woman to work? What did it mean for a woman to work the stage? What did it mean for a woman to put herself in the public sphere in quite this visible a fashion? These were questions that made a lot of people uncomfortable and the Parsi theatre found various ways of dealing with it, uh, but it was glacial. The pace of change at which women performers became the norm, as you can tell from the period that we're looking at, which is approximately eight decades, clearly change was slow in coming. Now, and most communities, including the supposedly progressive Parsi community, held such deeply naturalized notions of gender segregation that they believed, and I quote from Pandey again, the presence of real flesh and blood women in theater groups and on stage would corrode moral values and lead to extremes of debauchery. And this is obviously indicative of two things. First, that it was widely accepted that reality not only mirrored life, but was also responsible for being able to form it formulate what happened off stage. Uh, we're making a case here that 
Art imitates life, imitates art and it is cyclical. It isn't as simple as the fact of performance ending when the performance ends. It bleeds into our lived realities and helps shape them in myriad ways. There is a keen recognition of, um, of this fact. In addition, it also tells us something about the attitudes that were widely prevalent in the period for female bodies attempting to navigate what is slowly going to develop into a full-blown public sphere by the time we get to talking about the nationalist movement proper. A public sphere that in theory ought to be equal and equitable and accessible to everyone but in reality has always had mitigated levels of access based on our lived gendered realities. Given that actors, and you've heard me talk about both of these, the two stars, the two female impersonators who were absolutely the leading lights of, of this time were uh, a Gujarati actor by the name of Jai Shankar Bhojak, who was given the stage name Sundari, Sundari or the beautiful one, the beauteous one, and Bal Gandharva were undoubtedly the makers of fashion and shapers of opinion in their times. A story goes that the women of Bombay would be taken to the theatre by their brothers, husbands, fathers and so on and so forth to learn how to perform being a woman by watching the body of Bal Gandharva. You learned how to most fashionably drape a sari fashionably but also modestly. You learned what kind of a blouse was in fashion at a given moment by watching the body of Bal Gandharva traverse the stage. So it was an education. Going to the theater was clearly an education and notions of womanliness and femininity were constantly being iterated and performed by female impersonators and were meant to then be regurgitated by the women who would witness these performances. Um, I'm going to give you more examples of this in a minute, but apart from the sari and the blouse and so on and so forth, if the nathni is popular, if uh, and, and, and wearing it in a particular way on one particular side of one's nose, etc. If carrying a handkerchief is popular, uh, at one moment in time, these were largely because of Bal Gandharva, but, but more on that in a moment. Um, in addition to the impersonators not wanting to share the stage with women, um, Rinal Pandey also highlights how the entire ecology, as we've been discussing, everybody from the publics to the troops themselves, the theatres, everyone in some senses, because of all the reservations that they have about the performing woman, have con one isn't going to go as far as saying conspiracy fired to make it happen, but they're all complicit in blocking access to the stage for female performers for a rather significant uh, period of time. This is Bal Gandharva right here. Bal Gandharva, who, um, as I've, I've been repeating uh, rather endlessly, is one of the leading female impersonators of his time. Uh, this particular photograph is from the archive of Mohan Nadkarni, who does a beautiful book on Bal Gandharva in the 80s. And um, this is him with a phonograph. And uh, notice how the sari is draped just so. But more importantly, pay attention to the blouse. I'm, I'm, if, you can, if you can zoom in on this a little bit, if you can see it better, uh, the kind of, well, th this image, OK, wait. This might be a better image to be able to witness this, but a bunch of the blouses uh, that one sees Bal Gandharva even more than Jai Shankar Sundari sport are also what ultimately would come to be called the Parsi blouses. Uh, the, the, the style of the draping of the sari in both this image as well as the previous one are things that, it, at least in one period, a lot of the female impersonators based on the comportment of the Tagore women, for example. Uh, what becomes obvious from iterations and performances of womanliness like this is that it's a very particular vision of femininity that is on display. It is a very particular vision of what it meant to be a woman that is on display here. This woman is not outside class. She is not outside caste. In some instances, she's not even outside region. There is a 
keen location of this body along several class and caste axes which give us a particular vision of what it meant to be woman and what kind of woman would be valued in a given society at a given moment. What kind of performance of femininity or womanliness would give one social currency and acceptance in a given society during this period of time. Balgandharva, as I was saying earlier, was pretty much the last word when it came to setting the latest fashions in women's attire and behavior, and he was also something of a marketer's dream come true. Um, Balgandharva's face would be plastered across a range of female cosmetics, um, matchboxes, calendars, visual culture towards the early 20th century is rife with photographs of female impersonators uh, spread across an array of products, some of which make more sense than others. I mean, matches genuinely don't make sense because a female impersonator could never be seen smoking in public. It would have caused an absolute riot because it would have broken the continuity of the spell, the woman on stage would not be able to smoke in public and therefore the female impersonator who brought her to life could not be seen smoking in public regardless of whether he was um, on stage or off it. He popularized, as we were discussing, sari styles, draping the sari in particular ways, items of jewelry such as the nathni, the use of flowers to adorn one's and scent the hair, and as I mentioned earlier, carrying a handkerchief on one's person. Um, hold on to the handkerchief because we're going to go back to, uh, to why it might have been required in, in just one moment. It is said that photographs of Balgandharva graced the drawing rooms of many a home in Bombay uh, during this period. So it would be entirely par for the course to find uh, images of Balgandharva in his most iconic performances. And Shakuntala is one such uh, in, in several drawing rooms across the city of Bombay uh, in and across the early part of the 20th century sending no doubt uh, a, a number of people into a swoon. Palgandharva is said to have had an immensely sweet singing voice and the idealized diction, please pay attention to this, of a presumably upper or upper middle class speaker, indicating again as I was mentioning earlier that this ideal Indian woman that is slowly coming into being across the array of performances that we witness from people like Gandharva and, and Sundari and Champalal and so many others of their ilk is a very coded creature. She is very, very particularly a, a woman that comes from a certain location along, as we were saying, caste, class and other axes. The necessity of the female impersonator, as Catherine Hansen puts it, having an appropriate voice and physical features, both of which we're talking about here because Gandharva obviously had a sweet singing voice, etc., indicates that hearing and seeing are the senses that audiences were meant to have largely processed these female impersonators and their performances in. Now, Again, it becomes important for us to remember that the conventions of the Parsi theatre, because it was meant to have used a proscenium, meant that there were spaces between the performers who were on stage on a raised platform and audiences who would have been at a fair distance removed from them. That space becomes vital in maintaining the illusion of woman and womanliness that the female impersonators are performing on stage. It is vital to remember that the architecture, the physical architecture of this theatrical practice would have allowed that illusion to linger. If there is a camera and it is shoved very closely into the face of aforesaid female impersonator, that illusion is a little bit harder to maintain and that is part of the reason why with the advent of film, this practice is going to die something of a natural death. The other star in this period that you've heard me mention is Jai Shankar Sundari. Jai Shankar Sundari, Jai Shankar Bhojak, also known as Sundari, wrote that he relied on a method of total identification. This is in his autobiography, which is in Gujarati. 
Um, he writes that his method is based on total identification. He would study the women around him, the women in his family, the, the women that he had access to, and adopt some of their mannerisms. I'm going to read to you a tiny extract from this autobiography where he talks about what happens to him the first time he wears a blouse. I saw a beautiful young girl emerging from myself whose shapely, intoxicating limbs oozed youthful exuberance, in whose form is the fragrance of a woman's beauty, in whose eyes feminine feelings kept brimming, which is why it's useful that she had a handkerchief, in whose gait is expressed the mannerism of a Gujaratin, who is not a man but a woman. I saw such a portrait in the mirror, and momentarily I thought, that I was not a man. Um, we're going to spend some time unpacking this. Now, as is obvious, there are physical traits that are going to emerge from this. This is, uh, this is Sundari right here. And next to Sundari, you see Bapulal Nayak, who she was in a very popular established couple with. So this couple is replicated across a series of plays over a rather long period of time. This image is from 1904 and the next one is from 1915 which is 11 years later and it is the same couple. It is still Bapulal Nayak and still Jai Shankar Sundari. Um, Go back to that extract that I read you. It becomes obvious that there are physical traits that Sundari identifies with performing woman. She talks about shapely, intoxicating limbs and so on and so forth. But there are also emotive aspects. When she speaks about eyes that are constantly brimming with feeling, uh, there, there is the implication or the suggestion of a concept uh, that perhaps you're familiar with on this course, that of the angel in the house, which is a reference to uh, a Victorian ideal of performed femininity. The angel in the house stands in a binary with the with the working woman, with the, the, the basically the, the woman who made herself available in a public sphere. And this binary clearly found in favor of the angel in the house. And this is a term that becomes extremely popular in the late 19th century. It comes from a poem by Coventry Patmore. And this is uh, more or less the illusion that kind of creeps in in, in Jai Shankar Sundari's uh, analysis of what it means to be woman as well. His identification is so complete, he goes to the extent of temporarily discarding or perhaps transcending his manliness. Indicative of the level of feeling he describes is outside what would have been considered as acceptable or even recognizable behavior for a man, which is why he says briefly that momentarily I thought that I was not a man. But again, it's important to look at the phrasing there because when he says that he thought he was not a man, there is agency. He decides, he gets to choose whether momentarily he is or is not a man, which is not the same thing at all as the society around him making those choices for him. So there is still agency in this choice. There is agency in this identification because the, ultimately the female impersonator is precisely that, a female impersonator, even though in these liminal figures there is a blurring of a too easy kind of binarized notion of what it meant to be a man or what it meant to be a woman. And, and figures like this queer that binary in extremely interesting ways. Next, we turn to an autobiographical account that one gets from Master Champalal. This is from an interview he gave Mrinal Pandey many years ago. And part of what Pandey is quizzing him about is the injunctions that were laid upon 
the body of the female impersonator. What was it that a female impersonator could do? What was it that was outside the purview of a female impersonator? And, and he brings these out very interestingly in a list of injunctions. There are a very clear set of do's and don'ts that anyone who wanted to perform femininity or woman on stage with any kind of authenticity would have to rely on. And these are very interesting. So we will go over each one as we go. But these are all in his words. This is all Master Champalal. He starts by saying that the first visible marker when one encounters another body is the hair. And he says that for a female impersonator, it was a rule of thumb that you could never cut your hair. Now, hair is a uniquely and, 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 and immensely feminist issue. Body hair tells us much about the ways in which the, the notion or the sight uh, that is the body of the woman is coded. Um, but hair upon one's head and the way that it is styled, the length at which it is worn, can be carriers of class, can be carriers of experience, can be carriers and markers of age, which determines uh, how a female body will be consumed by anyone viewing it and um, Master Champalal is extremely unequivocal about this when he says that long silky tresses are a must for being a woman and it's interesting to me that he says being a woman not playing a woman because that is the kind of level that of identification that we're talking about regardless of whether you look at that extract from Sundari who we heard from recently uh, just before this or Champalal himself. Next, he says, as long as you play at being a female, notice that there is a shift. Here we're talking about being a woman, here we're talking about play at being a female, because there is also that space that needs to constantly be negotiated. Proximity to males must be a big no, exclamation point. I love the, the, the exclamation point right there. If you must meet boy friends or male members of the family, take care that theatre goers never see you. Meet other men and you risk getting a reputation. While travelling, you must sit in separate compartments. You will remember that this was part of the argument that was forwarded by troops for suggesting why they could not hire female actors. But if female impersonators also had to sit in separate compartments, that kind of dents the argument a little bit because those separate provisions clearly also had to be made for female impersonators. Separate compartments from male actors and stay in your tents upon arrival. So social distancing, social exclusion and a self-imposed quarantine, if you will, um, are clearly the lot of these uh, female impersonators. You must never invite men into your tents, whether from the troop or from the audience. The next bit of advice is practical in the extreme. Champalal says that the dance and music teachers would teach you how to modulate your voice and carry yourself because the visual and the auditory you will remember are the senses most engaged in when a theatre going public witnesses a female impersonator or any other performer on stage. And the idea here is that the dance and music teachers will allow the female impersonator to transform themselves into the characters that they must play. And if they are to do it authentically, that is if they are to perform the category woman authentically, they must let the words of the dance and music teachers be their command. The last injunction, and this is the one that I find most interesting, is that you should neither drink nor eat spicy food. They spoil the complexion, aka, again, the level of the visual slash physical, and your voice, and this is where it gets interesting, and make you manly and hot-tempered. The implication that spicy food or, or alcohol could make one manly clearly put the realm of alcohol outside of the reach of, of, of the sphere of woman, which is an injunction that has long uh, existed. But the notion that a woman is not allowed access to the notion of anger or to the idea or the practice or the act of anger, being angered, is something uh, that 
clearly Master Champalal seems to imagine is impossible for us to reconcile with the category woman. Uh, that, 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 there are a range of issues that emerge from this, one of which is the, uh, the notion of social distancing that I mentioned earlier or the aloofness that he recommends female impersonators engage in because what is problematic about this? What precisely could the problem have been? The aloofness becomes loaded because these words are a warning pertaining to the maintenance of relations between men, people of the same sex. So would that ensuing gossip or getting what in his words getting a reputation be problematic because it alludes to homoerotic or homosexuality as a possibility? Or is it problematic because the, ident the identification between performer and role is so complete that they're looking at the notion that a reputation, the character would acquire a reputation, that the performer would acquire a reputation because it was unseemly for a woman to be seen with a man who was not her immediate kin. Which of these is the problem area here? And that is something that we need to think about some more. The embargo on, consum on the consumption of liquor and spicy food uh, for its disruptive qualities is, like I said, interesting because it collapses the categories between the physical and the affective. The physical at the level of the skin and the voice immediately related to the affective because the other aspect of this is obviously the notion of being hot tempered and how it would not do for a woman to be seen as being angry. Now, we started by saying that we would go back to the composition of this audience that uh, I've been referring to. Um, this theatre going public is interesting because it, it, in some ways it becomes the, the cash, the ready audience for Indian film when it comes into being, with Raja Harish Chandra being the first Indian film in 1913. Uh, Raja Harish Chandra, made by Dada Sahib Falke, uh, also gives us uh, an introduction to this incredibly beautiful um, young actor called Anna Hari Salunke. Anna Hari Salunke, who you see here in his avatar as Sita in a movie called Lanka Dahan in 1917, was the quote unquote female lead for Raja Harish Chandra, which allows us to suggest that this young female impersonator uh, was actually the first female lead in Indian film altogether. Anna Hari Salunke played the female lead in Raja Harish Chandra and a local, uh, a bit of an urban legend goes that Dada Sahib Falke found him uh, when he was a young cook in a restaurant that Dada Sahib was, uh, was eating in and he heard him sing and discovered this beautiful young boy who he then recruits uh, and, and, and has uh, play his female lead in Raja Harish Chandra. Now, in the early years of Indian film, the female impersonators that we've been speaking about, including Gandharva, including uh, Sundari, and, and obviously Anahari Salunke, are the female leads. But this is a short-lived experiment for a number of reasons. But the reason primarily, and I've already alluded to this, uh, that this experiment is doomed to failure almost from the get-go, is that the camera is unforgiving. The illusion that we were talking about, the contract that any theatre going public engages in when they enter a theatrical space is the suspension of disbelief. The suspension of disbelief uh, is a concept that we get from Campbell and, and, and in it he, he holds effectively that the the, the theatre going audience, when it enters a, a space as coded in particular ways as the theatre, will no longer ask questions about things like a chronological continuity. You won't, for example, if you've been in the audience for 15 minutes, but if you've seen the action on stage shift a period of about five years, you know that you've only been there for 15 minutes. But the suspension of disbelief allows you to maintain the illusion that the continuity of narrative on stage requires you to engage in. So the suspension of disbelief was a contract between audience, performer, and troupe when this only became possible in a theatrical space. When we move from theatre to film, 
It is harder to maintain that illusion because the camera, as we've been saying repeatedly, is less forgiving. The distance afforded by a proscenium and the, the spaces that there were between performer and audience meant that it was possible for us to imagine that this was a woman, that this was a woman, or that this was a woman. It becomes harder when the camera insists on closing in on the face of Sundari, perhaps a young Sundari, but at this stage it becomes slightly untenable to sustain the illusion that who you are witnessing is indeed woman. And for this, among other reasons, but primarily this, it becomes, as we said, a little bit of a short-lived and failed experiment to try and insert female impersonators into the Indian film scene, which is slowly coming into being after 1913. And certainly from 1931, when we arrive at the talkie, because at that point, the illusion is no longer merely a visual one, it's also auditory, and it becomes that much harder to sustain. By the time female performers therefore finally become the norm, in Catherine Hansen's words, impersonators had already structured the space into which these female performers were to insert themselves, effecting the transition from stigmatized older practices to the newly consolidated Indian woman of the nationalist imagination. Now what are these stigmatized older practices that she's referring to? The notion of a performing woman was one one that was readily understandable in terms of dance traditions, in, in terms of certain musical traditions, specifically the sphere of vocalizing, perhaps much less than uh, a, a female instrumentalist, if you will. But music and dance were still spaces where one could concede the presence of a female performer. Some of those traditions were rather closely allied to courtesan traditions, were closely allied to something called the Indra Sabha as a space, from where some of these women performers finally enter uh, Parsi theater and from here into the Indian film industry. And these are stigmatized practices for a variety of reasons. A, the presence of the working woman and the implication that what they did was closely allied to uh, sex work in some cases in the courtesan traditions, which has been a connotation that's been extremely difficult to shake from the body of the working woman, especially in as public uh, a, a space as um, theatre and later film. Uh, and, and, and this is something that slowly begins to be mitigated uh, in, in this period. In fact, by the apparent anomaly of Indian males passing as females and foreigners passing as Indian women, the Parsi stage, and this is Hansen again, established a paradigm for female performance even before Indian women themselves had become visible. This is really interesting because the implication here is that what women are not able to do in a public sphere that isn't ready for accommodating them, it is still possible for us to witness on these stages, not perhaps in the form of the women themselves, because women performers and Indian women performers were rare uh, to come by. But you see woman performed, the Indian woman is performed before she actually becomes visible off stage. She is visible on stage before she becomes visible off it, is uh, the, the case that Catherine Hansen is making here. Now the world of these cross-dressing impersonators can be traversed, as I said, in a very fragmented form today. Few if any of the scripts survive and that's also partially because a lot of this material was improvised. Within loose structures, a lot of the material that one imagines the Parsi stage comprised of, and this is something that we become familiar with because of interviews with people who were directors, writers and actors on it. They talk about the amount, the, the high levels of improvisation within loose structures or parameters that have been set in terms of narrative uh, for each performance. But a lot of this material only becomes accessible to us today in the forms of autobiographies, journals, um, and, and, and some 
newspaper reviews of plays that did rather well, etc. But a lot of this material is not in English. A lot of it is in Gujarati, a lot of it is in Hindustani. And not much of it has been translated, uh, which is why at the national level, it's, it's difficult to talk about the, the, the legacy of Parsi theatre, except in very, very specific uh, pockets, linguistic and otherwise, where these were forms that uh, it remains possible for scholars to access. Parsi theatre is also the location in which female impersonation is most overtly linked to the fashioning of a widely circulated standard and this is important for female appearance and a modified code of feminine conduct possible because of the creation or opening up of the public sphere for women in society and as I'd started this lecture by saying part of the reason why this became possible was the spate of reasons you see listed here uh, the Bengal Renaissance, so the, the social reform movements in Bengal in the 19th century, followed by an internal reform movement in the Parsi community, starting in Bombay but spreading widely outward from the mid 19th century, and ultimately uh, the social reform movement more widely extant across Western India in the end of the 19th century. This also marks, it can be argued, the beginning of what came to be called the women's question in India. Uh, and, and some of the earliest people voicing these questions, the women's question, were male reformers. It stands to reason that this would have been because the male reformers were the ones with access uh, to the channels, the media channels of dissemination that the women simply were not. Which is not to say that women self-help groups or women reformers didn't, didn't exist during this time frame. They very much did and there were tensions between them and the benevolent male reformers who sought to voice these problems. But some of the earliest issues that the women's question revolved around were child and infant marriage and widow remarriage, which in theory was possible because of legislation to this end uh, about widow remarriage from the 1850s onwards, but was not practiced because of social excommunication, which remained the norm all the way into the 20th century. For a moment, talk now about the role of the spectator uh, in the choices that Parsi theatre makes about whether female impersonators or women performers, when they were both available, ought to be playing uh, the, the women characters in this space. Now, if, and we've said this before, life was to model reality and not merely imitate it, then it becomes important to see at what point it becomes untenable for this medium to actually continue to force the, the body of the female impersonator upon its audiences. And this is a point that's going to arrive only in the 1900s, the 10s, the 20s, the 30s. By the 30s, this will finally die out. And a part of the reason for this, uh, as I uh, mentioned in passing earlier, is that the composition and identification of certain classes or sections of men and women as comprising our theatre going audience is important. Because this is the first kind of audience that one has that is not patron driven, that is in some senses slightly more democratic because it is a non-aristocratic audience. It has working professionals, it has a bunch of people who have been through what is known now as the modern Indian education system which becomes largely possible after 1835 and the minute on Indian education which in some senses forces English medium education. I don't, it was not a nation state, upon British India, uh, let's just go with that, upon British India. Um, there were women in this audience and therefore, perhaps for the very first time, it became important to take into cognizance whether the women in the audience could relate most to women performing women on stage or female impersonators. And um, needless to say, that choice actually fell to female impersonators for rather longer than one would have imagined. By the turn of the 19th century, women were now, for the first time, as we were saying, the section whose enjoyment influenced the 
enactment of gender difference. And this is something that allows us to postulate that the Parsi theatre was indeed a site where gender both played itself out and was debated as well as contested, sometimes actively constructed in front of these audiences. Our processes, everything that we have outlined so far has several implications. On the one hand, this is Hansen again, impersonators and actresses transform the visual construct of womanhood into an image of bourgeois respectability by crafting and deploying different visual imagery and symbols, everything we were speaking about earlier, a particular drape of the sari, a particular inflection in one's voice, a particular accent as one spoke, uh, the carrying of a handkerchief because one must always be prepared in case one's eyes brimmeth over. All of this put together gives us a vision of what it meant to play an acceptable body woman. Further, the processes of signification at play here meant that these markers, even as they drew from a recognizable sphere of womanhood, were necessarily adding denotative layers to the bodies of these female impersonators. And that becomes uh, indicative of the fact that this is a continuous process. It was not a stable signifier. It was not something that once or iter that a single iteration of would have been enough. This was a continuous process and it was a negotiation that was engaged in on a fairly continuous basis. In addition, by subsuming the overt sexuality of the traditional female impersonator or courtesan performer and binding it within the norms of accepted and contemporary visions of modesty, cross-dressed performers together with playwrights and directors crafted a new interiority identifying the ideal woman with inner sensibility and the capacity to suffer. An easy way to understand what Hansen is talking about here is to think about the choices for role models that the nationalist movement will throw up. It will always be Sita, Savitri, Damyanti, not so much Surpanaka or Draupadi. Think about the spaces between these characters and the kind of agency that is implicated by each and a vision of the kind of womanliness that is being constructed emerges clearly. Female impersonators brought therefore mannerisms, speech patterns and appearance of the new middle class woman onto the stage and in so doing defined the perimeters of this construct within an ambit of acceptability. As becomes obvious since this is a code that is ultimately both grafted and then crafted upon the body of men, female impersonators who were men, this is not a challenge to the patriarchy in any way, shape or form. Without a visual template that enabled recognition of their spiritual essence, Indian women could not actually have become visible at all, is Hansen's contention because of this reason. Though this phase may have been forgotten, in the light of everything that came after it, that is the creation from 1915 onwards of a public sphere that is genuinely conducive to the entrance of women as equal, in some senses, participants uh, within the nationalist movement and everything that comes after it. This remains a period worthy of our consideration, not only because it highlights just specifically how gender roles are constructed, but also for the continuities that it affords us into the ways in which these performative practices continue to influence and create um, our extremely gendered lived realities. For this reason alone, uh, the period under study, the turn of the 19th century remains a fascinating one. Um, it can be argued that it, it was the, the, the error of the female impersonator came to be eclipsed with the arrival of Indian film, but the truth is that as we discovered uh, not a few moments ago, the first Indian female character to have been performed for Indian film was still grafted on the body of a young female impersonator. And for that reason alone, this backstory uh, 
uh, I think remains worthy of investigation and allows us to remember how gender is both performative and since it is a category that is up for constant negotiation, how certain forms of negotiation over others may allow us to queer it meaningfully. Thank you.